This was drainage for this building. It didn't take the early settlers here to realize exactly what we know now. It's very wet down here. So they would drain their building into this big pit. Now, if you look over here, we've got a different type drain. This is called a French drain. And what they did, they dug, dug a trench, okay. They lined the top and the sides with clay. And if you look where we haven't uncovered it, you'll see the clay, then they capped it, okay. So what you've got is a sealed unit with the clay around it. The rocks inside keep it from being collapsed, okay. Now, when we look at this, one of the things that we found no evidence of, but it tends to be there that there would have been a door across here so that when this filled up with, with water, you could let it settle a little bit so you didn't get the silt running down your French drain. You'd pull the trap door, drain everything out. You wouldn't get the silt going down and you have a little pressure up here. And this drain does have a slight decline as we go down this way. Lot 13, okay, and I'm almost right about here with the split. This was lot 13, this was lot 14. The house you see behind you sticks part way onto lot 14, okay? This nice French drain we see, and we'll see more of it down this way, runs almost completely across lot 14, which suggests this house was built prior to this land being split into lots. And we do know that there's a man named Lagrange, okay, who had a house on this corner prior to the split. So it's very likely this was Lagrange's house. What's unique about Lagrange is, uh, he wasn't very popular, he was a British loyalist, okay? And actually, they hung him in effigy here and threatened to confiscate his property after, was it 70, in 75, 17, 75. 1775. So it was either get out of town or else. So <laughs> like I said, later on, this was split into other lots. But the fact that we had this drain and this, prop, this house overlays two properties gives us real good evidence that this was probably his structure. Because this is um, Peter Lau's carriage house, right? So I imagine he would have been going to church in New Brunswick, I would have thought, because these rich guys tend to, be, tend to become uh, Church of England people. However, if it was before 1772, he wouldn't be able to get there very easily because there wasn't a bridge across the river. Though there was a ford up there, and maybe they just forded the river. But there were also, there were, there were these two strains of people from Dutch backgrounds that were at the landing. There were the rich merchant guys who came from families in New York. They were second and third gen generation Dutch. This isn't first generation. And then there were the less well-to-do traders who came from families that had emigrated into the Raritan Valley in the late 17th century, and they were farmers, basically. But obviously, some of the members of those families became traders and came to the landing. And so there are these two groups who come from similar backgrounds, uh, but different economic statuses, who are cooperating together in this business that was happening here at the landing. One of the problems in, in archaeology is knowing where to dig. Obviously, right? We can't dig it all up. It would cost us too much. It would take us too long. So we have to know where to dig. Fortunately, archaeologists came here. Somebody asked me about this. Oh, when they were building this overpass, they did testing to guide them as to where they could do their construction and where they couldn't. And where they built that, where they built that, um, the bridge, I mean, not the overpass, they didn't find any archaeological materials, but they tested here at that time in 1980 by digging little shovel tests, little peak holes in the ground, one by one foot shovel test. And they hit things like cobbles, and um, they actually hit a piece of that wall, and they found 18th century artifacts. So they knew there was something here, but nobody had come and really opened it up. They also did, more recently than that, they did remote sensing, like ground penetrating radar and a variety of other techniques. So they made maps by sending electronic signal into the ground. They made maps of the anomaly areas where something seemed to be buried. That when we recover shells, and we recovered huge numbers of shells on that cobble thing and in the pit, um, we weigh them and discard them. We just take samples back to the lab. It used to be that we took everything back to the lab, but everybody has run out of space. And we've also recognized that you don't do anything with it when you get it back to the lab. For a site like this, for prehistoric sites, it's a different story. So we just get the information we need in the field and then get rid of the stuff. When we dug here in 79, we saved every brick. 
and we filled up a whole shed at Rutgers with brick, and I'm willing to bet it's sitting there, and nobody's ever done a darn thing. <laughs> There's going to be a permanent exhibit at East Jersey Old Town, uh, but we're not going to finish the analysis for about four years. One of the wonderful things, that, you know, it takes much longer to analyze this stuff than to get it out of the ground. And one of the terrific things about this project is that they've really given us enough time to do a very good and a thorough analysis and to mount an exhibit that'll be there permanently. After the analysis of the artifacts is complete, there will be an exhibit at East Jersey Old Town. Here at the Runyon House, they will display the artifacts from Raritan Landing.